So, welcome back, everybody. Welcome to the second day. Uh, we, uh, yes, we want to welcome back everybody. It was uh, such a fantastic day yesterday, and uh, uh, I've heard there was a speed mentoring session this morning that went great. Uh, there were uh, eight mentees who were paired up with 32 professionals in the field. So. Uh, uh, thank you very much to Inka for organizing this and uh, Tina. And without any further ado, we would like to hand over the screen now to Caroline Bohlmann. You have met her yesterday at the advocacy panel. Hi, Caroline. Hello. And we walk you through the first session of this day, the new ways of caring. Caroline, Hi. the screen is yours. <clears throat> Good afternoon. And thank you so much. And um, I have the honor to welcome Rebecca Lewin for the keynote of this afternoon session. And let me introduce Rebecca with some words. Rebecca Lewin is curator responsible for exhibition and design at Serpentine Gallery London, where she has created many shows as well. Um, the Serpentine Pavilion in uh, 2018 and 2013. And she produced independent exhibition as well. The title of her talk brings us into the center of highly topical issues and I would like to turn the floor over to Rebecca. Welcome. Thank you. Oh, am I unmuted? Hi, thank you so much Caroline and thank you so much to both Martinez uh, for inviting me to be a part of your session. Uh, I will just begin my presentation here. We go. So, as Carolyn said, the um, the topic and the title of my uh, uh, presentation is "Caught Between Protection and Exposure: Entropy and Exhibition Making in the Age of Climate Crisis." Um, and it's worth beginning by acknowledging that uh, I'm speaking to you today from quite a specific viewpoint and set of experiences that is perhaps a little different from uh, many of the conversations that uh, an expertise that is held by the other speakers and um, possibly many of you as well. But I believe that these considerations exist in parallel with the conversations uh, being had by all of you. So as a curator working across art and design in a contemporary art space, that's the Serpentine in London. Um, and here are our two buildings uh, shown either side of uh, the Serpentine Lake uh, in Kensington Gardens and Hyde Park. Uh, it's a not-for-profit charity, The Serpentine, and we don't have a collection. Uh, but I wanted to show you our two buildings to give you a sense of the relatively small scale as well that we work to. Within my own practice, I'm interested in how artists, theorists, designers and makers, and indeed those whose work encompasses uh, multiple disciplines, can bring attention to important ecological questions. And I was really interested in participating in this conference because I believe that there is a history of artistic practice that is finally becoming embedded in institutional programming and practice that challenges institutional infrastructure and its impact on the environment. I thought I would begin with an extremely brief uh, sort of rattling through the history uh, of the frameworks that have led to the existence of art museums, galleries and institutions. Uh, especially those that, unlike the Serpentine, maintain a permanent collection and continue to acquire artworks every year. It's no coincidence that in the Western world, the historiography of art as a cultural phenomenon to be consumed by society at large began in the same era that saw the massive expansion of empire, the measurement of the earth, the invention of reliable and replicable timepieces, and most importantly, perhaps the displacement of people and materials around the planet. Uh, and while thinking about this, um, I was looking through uh, some of the earliest purpose-built uh, uh, museums and exhibition spaces in Europe. Um, and this is the Kunstmuseum Basel in Switzerland, uh, which was established in 1661. The old Ashmolean Museum, Oxford, which appropriately to that measurement of um, the earth and our movement around it, um, became the uh, Museum of the History of Science, and that was built uh, specifically to house instruments in 1683. Uh, and politically charged, um, as ever, the British Museum in London, 
uh, which was founded in 1753. Um, by 1798, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe remarked that until that particular moment in time, quote, with few exceptions, works of art remain generally in the same location for which they are made. However, now a great change has occurred in general, as well as specifically, that will have important consequences for art. This idea was elaborated by the writer Bettina Funke in a recent essay uh, on the work of American artist Wade Guyton, when she wrote, the change was one of context. Discrete objects were removed from a patron's life and placed in museums where a new broader public might contemplate them. Skip forward 200 odd years, and this removal of objects from their intended site of contemplation has brought another kind of removal. The art object must now exist outside of time. Museum conditions all but cryogenically freeze things that have cultural, monetary, or sentimental value, with humidity, light, and temperature maintained carefully to intentionally slow decay. The conditions required to keep humans alive, that is food, drink, sleep, exercise, exchanges with others, or at least anything louder than a whisper, uh, have all been removed from the art museum. Learned behaviors that control the urge to touch, to move quickly, to talk or laugh loudly, have been legitimated by the lawyers and banks who draw up loan agreements, touring contracts, bequests, valuations. By the 20th century, the weight of this framework became sufficient for it to have become its own medium. And it was adopted by artists with practices as diverse as Eve Klein, Miele Lademan Ukeles, Andrea Fraser, and Damien Hurst. And I really wanted to bring together a very strange combination of examples um, to try and walk you through what I'm thinking here. Uh, this is an image of Eve Klein's feed exhibition, which expressly sought to create a white cube in the gallery space that also replicated another space outside its walls, his own studio. In his instructions for the preparation and presentation of the exhibition on April 28, 1958, he wrote, in order to refine the ambience of this gallery, its pictorial sensibility in the first material state to an individual autonomous and stabilized pictorial climate, I must on one hand bleach the gallery to wash away the impregnations with the numerous preceding expositions. In painting the walls white, I wish not only to purify the space, but above all to transform it through this action and gesture temporarily into my workspace, my studio. Klein's exhibition was titled The Specialization of Sensibility in the Raw Material State into Stabilized Pictorial Sensibility, the Void. And his white gallery was accompanied by blue curtains at the entrance and blue cocktails served to visitors that also turned their urine blue. The materiality of the artwork had therefore already become porous and the performativity of the temporary exhibition and the even more temporary opening night foregrounded. A very different approach was taken uh, about 20 years later by Mirla Ladomenukeles, who wrote her, or oh, 10 years later, my apologies, wrote her manifesto for maintenance art in 1969 as part of a proposal for an exhibition on care. If everything could be art, she argued, why not the job of maintenance? Why was the physical act of caring for objects valued so low? She engaged in various acts of cleaning around the museum from washing the front, front steps to polishing one of the vitrines. And she later replied these questions uh, far beyond the walls of the museum to the organizations of maintenance workers themselves, interviewing and collaborating with staff from the New York Sanitation Department, among others. Andrea, Famer, Andrea Fraser's museum highlights from 1989 drew attention to the performativity of the docents, the detailing of exhibition furniture, such as emergency exit signs, an information desk, the toilets, the water fountain. Quoting reports, articles, and histories of the building in which her work took place, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, she contrasted justifications for the existence of the museum for the betterment of society with the infrastructure that determined what could be contained within it and what by the same token was kept out of it. Shortly after in 1990, Damien Hirst's Thousand Years created or perhaps poked a hole in the pristine white cube space, demarcating a void within it, 
where the messiness of birth, death and decay were allowed to take place. Hearst described the work simply, the fear of death is the strongest emotion. It's about how you can cushion yourself from death in some way. Now, of course, he in this quote is described, the it that he uses is describing the artwork, but I wondered whether replacing the referent with the museum uh, is cushioning uh, all of us and the objects from death in some way. Uh, and that seemed just as apt. And in fact, uh, shortly after this in 1993, Boris Grice wrote in his essay, The Logic of the Collection. In the collection, things function differently than they do in reality, in life. Instead of being consumed, they are preserved. The collection as a place of preservation is indeed at the same time a place of death, as well as the site where the attempt is made to overcome death. So to return to my first question, thinking about my relationship as a curator um, to the relationship of experienced um, conservators, uh, if many of the key questions that are faced by conservators really have to do with the passing of time and the purpose of a museum is to slow or delay entropy, producing objects that exist outside of time. And artists have successively sought to question, to draw attention to, or even break through the invisible or visible structures of the museum that hold them. The question we now ask, must ask ourselves is what to do with art and with museums that if we believe the IPCC reports of the last several years, we are out of time. In the here and now, art institutions are finally catching up with the necessity of placing temporality at the forefront of their programming, in their infrastructural decisions, and in the minds of their visitors. From my own experience, two recent exhibitions I've worked on at Serpentine attempted to introduce an awareness of time passing and the temporality of the exhibition period in a way that could also accommodate a greater degree of porosity and unpredictability. The first of these was Ian Cheng, who in 2018 uh, built and installed a group of artificially intelligent critters called Bob, each of which grew physically and mentally uh, over the course of the exhibition. The unpredictable input that led to their differentiation was the presence of the visitors who could interact uh, that's a couple of differentiated bobs, uh, who could interact uh, via smartphones, as you can see on the bottom right, with uh, inbuilt facial recognition software. Pierre Huig, meanwhile, created feedback loops in the gallery between visitors, AI-produced images, the conditions of the exhibition itself, and a population of flies. Again, we can see that there's a symbol here of a non-human community whose short life cycle points to an altogether different temporality than that of the exhibition. He revealed the history of the institution by sanding back through layers of paint on the gallery walls, leaving the dust from this sanding on the floor that would inevitably, inevitably be picked up by people's shoes and walked back out into the park and the streets of the city. We're told, however, that we're living in the age of climate crisis of the sixth mass mass extinction, uh, as Elizabeth Colbert called it. The questions being asked of artists and institutions alike are more urgent and more direct than ever before. A more recent project of mine at Serpentine investigated the complex and tentacular reach and impact of the global timber trade. Former Phantasma's exhibition titled Cambio, which incidentally is on tour at the moment in the Museum für Gestaltung in Zurich. So if any of you are joining from Switzerland, please go and see it, I have yet to be able to travel. Um, but we presented through the exhibition, a series of case studies that centered on familiar materials that offered balanced responses. I could speak about it at length, but I'm aware that I'm running out of time. Uh, and a summary of the show really might be as, as follows, that it is not enough for us to say that we must switch away from plastic to wood in search of a more natural and less harmful product Rather, we must address the systems that are in place in order to reduce our consumption and actively regenerate forests and woodlands. An imminent exhibition, uh, which will take place this summer at Serpentine, is like the wider project it is a part of, titled Back to Earth. Just skip through the next two. Uh, it is a multi-year, multi-vocal and multidisciplinary project. And we have asked artists, designers, writers, and philosophers 
to respond to the climate crisis. One method we have adopted to subvert the extractive tendencies of art galleries is to reverse the classic commissioning process. Rather than a one-way vector of bringing artists' responses to the world into the gallery space, we, inst we have instead asked them what form of support they need in order to speak about ecological issues. This support might be providing further visibility, creating a network of knowledge or influence, or helping to find funding, or all of those things. Uh, an example that I've just got up on screen uh, are two uh, very different outputs from a long running research project by the artist Carolina Caicedo. Uh, one where she's trying to link um, all of the ways in which um, knowledge, uh, exchange, um, connectivity and power um, are brought together when thinking about how to transition away from um, uh, fossil fuel energy and towards a more social and just um, energy transition. Um, she says, infrastructure as we know it has been constructed with a climate pattern in place, but under the current uncertain and changing climate conditions, we have seen an increase of infrastructure damage and collapse in the likes of bursting dam spillways, falling bridges, leaking pipelines, and mine tailing dam collapses. We are so vulnerable depending on an energy grid we have absolutely no control over. So her long-term project is to really bring communities into direct conversation with the organizations and infrastructures uh, that really manage the energy uh, that supplies those communities uh, and to think together about alternatives. And the last one I wanted to end on was Caribbean Film Collective's uh, The Family. Uh, this is a new film commission that we will be showing this summer. Um, and the project is aimed at enhancing ancestral Emmy narratives across the Southern coastal region of the Anson Bay in the Northern Territories of Australia, and specifically about the ecologically fragile Cape Ford region. And the ultimate goal of the project is by making this film also to divert resources, funding and knowledge to that region. The last thing I wanted to say and to end on really is that it's not enough for an institution to think about uh, more radical programming to divert funding and resources and knowledge out to artists and communities that they're working with in the wider world. It's also important that in order to uh, address climate change head on, that the institution attempts to test, for example, the lower limit uh, of an exhibition's carbon footprint. And we're working with Julie's Bicycle to develop a matrix in which all members of the team can log carbon emissions and make alternative decisions throughout the course of developing a project. And while we know that no exhibition is ever likely to be carbon neutral, we want to ask questions like what kinds of artworks can we include in our gallery if there are no temperature or humidity controls running at all? What happens to the light levels, visibility, and experience of an exhibition that relies on natural light? And most pragmatically, what questions do we need to ask of ourselves, our suppliers, and the artists that we work with that will allow us to map our carbon footprint accurately? I will end there and stop screen sharing. Thank you very much.